What is up guys? It's Ryan from Elevate Cyber. Now in this video, we are going to be picking up uh, on the next uh, big project here in uh, Black Hat Python. Now the last time we, we put together Netcat, we recreated that. This time we're actually going to create a TCP proxy. That's the next sort of example here uh, as we go through the content. So what I'm going to do, because, you know, just like the Netcat uh, project was a pretty, fairly large one. I mean, in comparison to commercial projects, commercial software, not too complicated. But as far as what I can cover thoroughly in one video, it will be a very long video. So I'm going to split this up into two here. We've done about half of the uh, program. We've completed about half the, com uh, the program here. So I'll be stepping through what it does. And then in the next one, we'll be building out these last two functions down here. And uh, I'll be demoing the finished product as well. So now with a proxy, the best way that I can describe a proxy for those of you who you know have done some security stuff, maybe some stuff on the offensive side is think about Burp Suite, right? Burp Suite is a, is a proxy tool, right? And, uh, you know, you can modify the request, modify the response. Uh, if you think about, like, even Metasploit, right, it can sit there as, like, you, you could have, like, a proxy handler and things like that. If you've ever done any pivoting, most certainly, right, you can use the compromise system as a proxy. Uh, you know, Wireshark, things like that. I think the best example would be Wireshark, though, because it can kind of sit there in the middle as a, as a proxy, you can sniff packets and things like that. And one of the examples the book actually gave was uh, some use cases for knowing how to build something like this from scratch in Python is that sometimes you might need some of the functionality available for some of these tools like a Wireshark or something like that. And uh, you won't have access to being able to use it or there'll be some kind of security limitation there that would prevent you from being able to use it on an engagement. And uh, I think certainly if you're a red teamer, this is even more important to have an, a basic grasp of. But uh, yeah, so there's there's so many use cases for this really. Uh, in the book, if you if you pick up the, uh, the book Black Hat Python, it'll break down uh, even more use cases as well. But let's just get right into it. So at the very top, you know, pretty standard, we have our imports here. These are the same imports that we've been using on a lot of our projects here. So sys to interact with the system commands, right? Uh, and then the socket, or actually, yeah, in this case, the specific reason we're using sys is so we can make this a command line tool and later on take in uh, command line arguments uh, to pass the data in so that we can create the proxy according to our specifications, right? And then socket, of course, is needed because we're going to be pairing an IP address with a port and then threading because we're going to make it a multi-threading uh, ser uh, server, right? So we're going to be able to proxy and actually have support multiple connections. So that's why we're using the threading module. So the first thing in here, I know this can look kind of crazy. And when I first saw this, it was a little bit overwhelming, but uh, we can really break this down in a way that is a lot more simple. So we have a hex filter here. Basically, all this data here, what it's doing is it's going to it's going to look for character lengths of three, and I'll I'll get to to that in a minute why we're looking for character length of three. But if we see a character length of three, uh. We are going to uh, we're going to loop through 256 characters, right? The ASCII character uh, set is 256, so we're going to loop through each one, and we're going to be looking for which ones are three character length. If they're not, we are going to instead print off a period symbol here, the dot symbol, right? So now let's get into why these why this length is important here. So if I come down here and I drop into a Python intera uh, interactive shell. I'll just type Python 3 to do that. Uh, one thing that you'll see here is that you, we keep seeing this CHR, right? CHRI, right? So this is a character function here, and I can pass in the ASCII code of any character. So let's say we have an ASCII code of 65. 
that would be the uh, the equivalent for a capital A in ASCII because that's the ASCII character code uh, for capital A. Now, the reason it's three is because there's three parts to this, right? There's it's it's of length three. So you have this single quote here. That's one. A is two, and then the other single quote is three. So if we look at the representation, right? of that and we take the length of the representation it will be of length three right now if we look at something that's a way that we can know that hey this is uh this is like a string character like this is a easy rep this is very easily represented in ascii right now we could have something that's like a you know some kind of Unicode string or whatever, something that is like uh, a hex code or something like that that uh, doesn't correspond to a number or a letter, right? So, for example, if I look at 30, whoops, <laughs> I completely butchered that one. Let's, let's try this again here. So, if I look at 30, that's actually this uh, hexadecimal representation doesn't really correspond to a, a letter or a number or anything like that or a special symbol. So, that has a different length, right? You see there's way more. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. So it should have a length of six. Let's take a look here just to verify that. Yep, and it has a length of six. Now, you might have various lengths here, but the point is, if it is something that can easily be represented in ASCII, it's going to be of length three. So that is why we have this here. And uh, otherwise, we're just going to print off the dot there. So if I, if I actually run this code, and we're doing a join, right? We're going to join it all together in one long list. And so actually, I'm going to show you, so you, if you're more visually minded, so you can see what's, uh, what's going on here. So if I do join on all of that, we can see that uh, here it is. It comes all the way to here till we finally get to our symbols. And then after the symbols will be the capital letters, a couple more symbols, lowercase letters. And this is just going through all the ASCII from um, the start all the way to 256. All right. So that that's looping through all those uh, character codes there. So, that allows us to understand what's going on here. This is just basically our filter, so we can strip out this stuff in, uh, for formatting purposes, right? So now when we jump into this first sec uh, first function here, the hex dump function, we're passing in source length 16 show equals true. And the first thing we're going to say is if is instance and pass in source bytes. So if it is, uh, you know, we might get a string, or we might get a, uh, a byte string, right? If it's in uh, bytes format, then we're going to simply decode that so that we have it as a string because we want to get everything in a uniform data type so that we can process it all the same. And here we're just initializing a list. Now this list function, this is a built-in function, just so you know. This is not something that we define anywhere. This is built into uh, to Python here. So basically all we're doing is we're initializing an array, initializing a list, right? And now we have a for loop here and saying for i in range in range uh, from zero to the length of the source that we that we you know passed in here, length, uh, we're going to define a variable word and it's basically going to pick apart the words and then define a variable printable. And what it's going to do is going to take the word and this is another built-in function here built-in method is uh, this translate method here. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the word and it's going to translate based off of the hex filter that we defined up here. So this is the transformation it's going to make. Is It's going to look for character length of three. If it doesn't have a length of three, then it's going to write a period symbol. Right, and then hex uh, hexa variable here is just doing a join, and I know this can look kind of crazy, but basically all of this here is just so it can output the hexadecimal 
in the proper way. If you guys ever used a hex editor before, this is the kind of data that you're going to be looking at, right? This is what you're going to be receiving. I don't know. Maybe I could pull something up like that uh, just so you can see for the visual-minded people out there. If I have... Um, let's see. I think there's one called hex edit. If I look at, say, my Etsy password file, it could be any file. Uh, X, what was it? XXD is another hex editor. It's going to look something, a little something like this, right? You're going to have your hexadecimal representation over here and then the string representation over here. So we'll be able to get both views. So that's just basically what we're doing. You don't, you, you don't really have to worry too much about this. This is just doing some formatting to get it, to get the hexadecimal to display kind of like I was showing you over here. Okay. And it's basically going to keep appending to the array. We define the array up here and now we're just going to keep appending it as we loop through the, uh, the source. And so if show, then we're going to print the line in results. So what, what that's going to do basically is that if we, if we, if we set show equal to true here, and that's something that we're, you're going to see later, we're going to pass that in, in the command line argument. But if we said we want to show, then what it's going to do is it's going to print the, uh, the each line in the array. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to, to return the array itself. And so that's that function. The next one that's important is the receive from function. Now, we're, it's going to pass in the connection and uh, initialize a byte string here uh, as the buffer. And we're going to set the timeout to 10 here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to do a try accept just to do some basic error handling here. It's going to be a while true because we want to be able to receive the data pretty much endlessly until the user cancels it with like a control C or whatever. And now the important thing to note about this function is it's going to be used. We haven't wrote this logic in yet, but as you'll see later, this is going to be, this function is going to be used both uh, for both ends of the, uh, of the connection, right? So you remember the proxy that we're creating here, it's sitting in the middle, but you have like your target system and then your local system. And so each end of the, uh, proxy is going to need to use this receive from function in order to uh, keep the connection going here. And if there's any error, we're just going to print a generic error message. And we're going to, of course, return anything in the buffer, right? We're going to keep appending to the buffer, I believe. Yep, right here. Append the data to the buffer, and then we're going to return the buffer. So... Basically, there's two more functions here that I have not yet written. Uh, well, th that's down here. Uh, I guess I'll get to that in a second. These two here, I almost skipped over them because they're so short. Because for this for this program, we're keeping it as a uh, almost like a. This is very reusable code. So in this case, we're just creating a basic proxy. We're not trying to do anything special with it. If we did want to, we can add into these functions, right? Request handler and response handler. So. I have here in the comments, you know, this can be some kind of uh, logic that you add in here for fuzzing or testing for authentication issues, even finding credentials like admin passwords and things like that. Whatever you want to do, it can be done here. Now, this is why I made the burp suite analogy before. If you are familiar with uh, how burp kind of sits in the middle as a proxy, right? You got your proxy and you can actually modify the request before you send it to the server or the response before it gets back uh, to the client, that's exactly what you're able to do in these functions. So think of it like that, like modifying a request or a response. Uh, those would go in these respective functions here. Now, here's where I was trying to get to earlier. These functions, actually, it's, it might seem like, oh, I just didn't write two of the functions yet. These are actually the most, the biggest like meat and potatoes of the program, if you will. This is where a lot of the logic is going to reside. So we'll have our proxy handler and our server loop. So those those are going to be really, really big, and we're going to be adding into them uh, in the next video. 
when we complete this thing. And of course, we're going to define our main function down here. And uh, basically, here is just setting this up as a something we can run from the command line, right? In this case, there's actually a lot that you have to supply as a user to use that. Maybe that's something we can improve upon in the in the future as we kind of customize this code here as well. Maybe implement it a little bit more like our netcat one where we where we have uh, we, we can maybe make use of some flags to make it easier to use. But uh, as of right now, what you have to do is you have to actually specify five pieces of input. So, here we're just printing off like if basically this line here it says if the user didn't uh, didn't supply five fields of input then print the usage right so we're going to print off hey this is how you use it proxy.py the first one and it matters what order you enter this in as well the first one is the local host then the local port and the reason we have this end uh, empty string here is because by default python will between print statements will add in a new line if you want to print things off on the same line in different print statements you just have to add this to the end so that it won't do a new line here because we're not done yet right we got to supply the remote host remote port and receive first and then we we do want a new line here so we can show an example of it uh, this would be an example here and then it'll exit after that so that the user can supply the correct information so Here's where we're actually defining, like, okay, whatever the user puts in. Remember, it starts at zero index, of course, but at the zero index is actually the name of the program itself, proxy.py. So that's argv0. So this would be argv1, which is the local host. Argv2 is the local port. Argv3 will be the remote host, right? Because it's a proxy, we're connecting between it. And then the remote port is argv4 and then finally receive first is argv5 and that's a boolean true so uh basically some logic down here to say if uh receive first is you know they pass in true to receive first then we'll set receive first equal to true else it will be false so really we could enter in anything else here we can enter in some bogus data instead of true and all it will say is okay it's not true so we're just going to set it equal to false interesting way that's just how we're implementing it so that's how it's going to behave and then here we're calling our server loop which we that was one of the ones we didn't build out yet and so that's the reason you you have this red outline here it's like hey this is undefined and similarly the reason you have this yellow here is because it's saying hey you define this but you didn't actually use this variable yet so that will all be cleared up when we uh, finish this out next time. And then, of course, down here is just saying, hey, if this is run as, uh, if you directly run proxy.py, then it, then run the main function, right? So, yeah, we've, we've been adding this on to pretty much all of our programs here, so nothing too crazy there. But, uh, yeah, see, even me explaining half of the logic of this was an 18-minute video. And so that's why I want to do this in two parts so I don't have like a crazy like 40 minute long video. As we get a little bit more further down the line in this book, you know, the examples and things we're going to be building is going to get more and more complex. So it's going to require more time to explain. So hopefully, you know, you guys got a lot out of that. If you enjoyed this one, definitely subscribe if you haven't already and hit the like button as well to help get this uh, pretty cool technology, pretty cool techniques, things to have in your tool belt out there you know, to the rest of the world. And I will see you guys over in some of those other Black Hat Python videos. If you want to refresh or catch up, maybe you skipped around a little bit, go through this in whatever order you, you know, you'd like to, and I'll see you guys right over there. Thanks for watching.